Welcome to another episode of Empower Apps. I'm your host, Leo Dion. Today, I'm joined by Matt Massacott again. Matt, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So uh, before we get into your upcoming presentation at Swift Toronto, um, go ahead and I'll let you introduce yourself and chime. Sure. Um, well, my name is Matt. I'm a longtime macOS developer. I've done a little bit of iOS, but not that much. Um, I put some time in at Apple, working on iOS actually, uh, and then um, ended up uh, working independently. And so I'm like a part-time independent developer right now. And one of the main projects I work on is called Chime, which is a like lightweight, minimalistic editor for the Mac. And we had you on, was it last year or a year and a half ago to talk about extension right about kit? Yeah, 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 it was right about a year ago. Um, and it's funny. Go ahead. It's funny because uh, I don't remember where I was in my extension kit journey when we when we talked, mm -hmm. um, but all the stuff that's come up for my work on concurrency started there. Okay. So before we get into that, I do want to ask, so did anything happen with extension kit since dub dub and like as far as extension kit is concerned like or is, how's that going outside of um, what we'll talk about today i would you know i would love to like sit down with somebody who works on extension kit at apple and just like hear the story about what is going on there yeah because they um just to remind people so it was introduced uh, last year with absolutely no mention at all during no WWDC. talks. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, no, nothing, which is really unusual. Um, additionally, it's a weird thing to add to Mac OS, right? Because almost all of it, almost all the features that it provides were technically possible before they were extension kit makes it easier. Okay, but loading code as plugins this is all things that you could do before. So the and parts of extension kit are and to this day still exposed on iOS. So it was a weird, it was a weird thing. And it really felt to me like it was supposed to launch for iOS, got pulled at the last minute. That's why we saw no uh, video about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just kind of like let it sit until this year. And then so this coming up year, I was convinced, 100% convinced that it was going to be released for iOS. And what, what's weird is more of it was added, more API was added to iOS, but still not enough to actually use it. And there was also no videos about it. How about Mac OS? Anything different there? No, it's basically the same. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, so something yeah. funny is going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is it only available on Mac OS? So no Vision, no watch, oh, no TV? So Vision OS is the same. No watch, but Vision OS and iOS and, and um, uh, well, iPad. It's watch the same thing where there's portions TV? of it are available okay. on iOS, but not enough to actually use it. Okay. Well, it's we'll put, just, it's just bizarre. We'll put links to our previous episode. Um, I'm definitely interested in jumping into it once I get farther with Bushel, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah. so it sounds like your work in extension kit, you found out a few little quirks with async away. Um, specifically you want to give like, just kind of the big picture of what kind of issues you've run into. Yes, absolutely. Well, so it started with my work on extension kit. Part of the idea here is you build an API that other developers are going to use. And it's this public API that you publish as part of your extension kit SDK, however you're going to package it up. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I might as well be as forward looking as possible. At the time, I hadn't looked at concurrency at all, but I thought this okay. is a great opportunity. I'm going to dive in here and I'm going to see if I can make it work. Yeah. And at the beginning, that seemed like a wonderful idea. It was, it's felt easy. It felt like you're just getting rid of completion, uh, of completion handlers. handlers and replacing yeah. them with the async keyword. Like it felt really nice. And I got pretty far with it. Uh, the integration with Chime is also probably uncharacteristically deep. I would imagine that most people that are going to be using Extension Kit, it's going to be a small feature that you're going to expose. But with Chime, it just made a lot of sense. So it's very deeply integrated into the application, used all over the place, everywhere. Okay. Um, and so it impacted pretty much everything about how the app works. And that meant that concurrency started, it's a little bit viral. And so it started getting it, working its way into more parts of the application. And I think the first thing that really uh, hit me when I started realizing, okay, I don't know if I know what I'm doing, is I started seeing really terrible race conditions. 
where I would have like these events happening A, B, C, but, in, but what would be happening in the extension would be, they would not be in that order. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and at first I was like deeply confused by this, but yeah. after I started looking into it, I realized that it makes, it, everything makes total sense what was happening. What was going on here was I was just putting these unstructured tasks to start running, to get, to get an async context. And I think this is a thing a lot of people will do is that apps fundamentally, they start with one thread, one main, one main, I mean thread. actor, but one main thread. Yeah. And eventually they're going to start running stuff and they need some sort of async context to do that. Mm -hmm. And so in many cases, and if you look at, you'll see blog posts all over the place saying concurrency is easy. And if you don't have an async context, you just use a task and you're done. Mm -hmm. And that is technically true, but tasks don't synchronize across each other. So you can make them synchronized. You can like start task A and then wait inside of task B for task A to be done. That's totally allowed. That's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't establish these explicit dependencies across tasks, they run in any order. There's absolutely right. no dependency enforced by the system at all. And so this is kind of where I first started running into problems is because I was introducing concurrency in this fundamental part of my app, but it, they were not really connected inside of the app structure. So there's like one call over here and then many, 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 many layers and APIs uh, uh, distant from that place, there'd be another async call that I needed to make. And previously, those were completion handlers. They would start, run a bunch of code, and then this one would start, and they would always start one after another. And replacing those calls, those completion-based calls with tasks, meant that that ordering was no longer being enforced. And that's really the fundamental thing that I was running into. That okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna don't take this the wrong way, but that sounds like a feature, not a bug. That they uh, were not being ordered? Yeah, because um yeah, that's where you're kind of like for me an async task would be something you just run whenever you want it and it has no dependencies per se. Mm -hmm. But what it mm -hmm. sounds like here is um is you need to set up some sort of like I mean, it sounds like a use case for an actor where you have one central lane where things are run and it can only be run on that lane. Is that correct? Actually, no. <laughs> but okay, that's okay. A very, that, that makes sense what you're saying. And you're right. It's not a bug. It's a, what this is is an implication of changing from uh, completion-based systems to async systems. Right, right. And so the, the implication, and it's like, took me a super long time to actually even understand like what is going on here. And the reason is that a completion based system has, it, you call it synchronously. Right. And then it will do its work internally. It'll do its work asynchronously. And an async based system cannot, it is impossible to do that with an async based system. The caller is the one who's responsible for coordinating these things. Right, right, so right. So you might have some nice, you might have some nice object that has a whole bunch of completion handler based blocks and internally it's got its own dispatch queue. And when you make a call, it synchronizes everything right. internally. And right. that is no longer possible to do. That pattern is not possible to do with Swift concurrency. Right, right. So it's you're just not supported. So you were saying actors are not what you want. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because you have to use the async keyword. As soon as you use the, as soon as you introduce a wait, it's up to the caller that writes a wait to do the ordering. Okay. Actors cannot internalize that stuff. Okay. And you might, and at first you might think, oh, of course they could, because you just put the queue inside of the actor. And that's true. You can put the queue inside of the actor, but you no longer have the ability to serialize putting stuff in that queue. That's okay. up to the caller. Okay. And so this is like this fundamental change. I think a lot of people are very used to, I was certainly was, used to writing code this way, and you just can't do that anymore when okay. you're going into concurrency. Okay. So what did you end up doing to get around that? Uh, well, first I would say I swore a whole bunch and then figured out what the problem was. Once okay. I it took me a long time to even understand the problem, but once I got it, what I ended up doing was introducing a queue. Like fundamentally, you need a queue. Mm-hmm. Right. There are many problems. Many, any, pretty much any time you have a stateful system, you right. have to be able to serialize these things. Okay. And so I had to introduce a queue. Okay. Um, but I had this problem because I had a whole bunch of legacy code, and I could have like spawned task A up at the top, grabbed, a, um, grabbed it in a variable, and then passed it through all these callers to the spot where I called task B. That right. would have worked. Right. But it was just so awkward and so. It was just totally unwieldy to do that. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I introduced a global queue. So one queue for the entire application. Okay. And I could submit, instead of just um, spawning these like standalone tasks, mm -hmm. I would 
make a make a task that task and then put it into this global queue okay and that was my i suppose i would call that my uh, my stopgap solution that enabled me to remove all the race conditions it's okay. gross but it was possible to do <laughs> What if, like what other people what what if other people what if you found other people are doing online for what you're particularly running into here? I have not found anybody really talking about this exact kind of problem in this okay. way. I think people have noticed the ordering problem of a standalone unstructured task is very well understood. And you said it's not a bug; it's a feature. And you're right; that is how it's supposed to work. Um, but I think that uh, when you start introducing concurrency with stateful systems into existing applications, that's yeah. the only time these kinds yeah. of things are really gonna come up. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the key is like stateful, right? Where it's like, oh, you need to know when something is ready and then run the task. Right, um, absolutely. Um, that's the critical component of it. I think many people have been introducing concurrency into their apps using things like the SwiftUI.task, and they're probably loading code, like, not loading code, loading data from some remote, uh, from some remote server or something like this. Right. Those things tend to be not stateful. Right. Right. Yeah. What um I wanted to jump in and talk a little bit more about you mentioned some like older APIs that you're running into. Um were any of those running into issues with async await? Now I'll I'll just preface by saying I've run into issues with like NS operation. Like maintaining some old code that uses NS operation and then we want to do async await and it's like, oh yeah, there's like all sorts of issues with older Objective C APIs once you start doing async await. Did you run into anything like that? Um, I'm very curious what your problem was, but first I'll say I totally did. So okay. uh, I think that the my first realization along this journey was that I didn't really understand how to establish asynchronous contexts in a way that would let me do the things I was already doing. That was okay. one big realization. But then the second really important realization was all the warnings are turned off by default. And so what I was doing was I was making an API that was inherently async, but I was, because there was no warnings, I didn't understand how to do that correctly. Okay. And so once I started realizing, okay, in order to do this, I have to turn on these warnings, turned on these warnings, um, I had built an API that was fundamentally incompatible. And now what does that even mean? And it could be what you're talking about is mm -hmm. if you have an async function, it needs to be either accepting sendable stuff or yeah. it needs to be uh, so both accepting sendable stuff and returning sendable right. things or isolated to a global actor. And you have no other alternative. That is it. Right, right. And so what's interesting, so two things I have noticed existing APIs. One is Apple, I think many people on Apple, in Apple internally, did not realize this was the case. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so Apple has shipped a few APIs that um, don't pass these warnings, but they are explicitly async. One yeah. example... Like one example I'll give that I just happened to notice was it's in HealthKit. It was like a HealthKit, I can't remember if it's called Query, but it's called an async query. And it is specifically built to allow you to use concurrency. Yeah. Um, both accepted and returned non-sendable stuff. Yeah. So whoever yeah. made this did not understand that that was, that was an impossible API to build. Yeah. And I think that's a big, like, that's a big Swift 6 thing is like all that stuff has to be fixed by then. Right. Um, but now, so yeah. the HealthKit team had this problem, right? Because because they shipped this API, they they must either make the HK Health Store, I think it's called, mm -hmm. and they must make that sendable as well as the return value, or they were going to have to deprecate this API. Because if they couldn't make them sendable, this API can never be made to work. Or well, they I just, they could... isn't there like an attribute where it can basically say, oh yeah, it's sendable, don't worry about it, and you don't it do has anything to about it? be sendable, but yes, yes, that's okay. right. Okay, okay, you're yeah. right. I suppose the other, other alternative and one that I have used a lot is you just can't use this on anything other than a global actor. And yeah. that's the big hammer that, that you can use that. You can always put things onto your own global actors, onto yeah. the main actor, and that is necessary in many cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, so HealthKit, were there any other APIs you ran into, like any AppKit stuff or anything like that? Well, um, uh, extension kit. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, and widget kit. So, the, so examples of these things are these are APIs where it's probably supposed to be main actor isolated. And by all accounts, by how you're understanding how the APIs work, it really should be. But Apple has not done that annotation yet. I want to say, like, if you do any of the new stuff in in Xcode 15 beta, everything is like automatically main actored no, for you. That's not true. That's oh, not really? True. Yeah. So both extension kit and widget kit are still not fixed. And so okay. it's impossible to use without warnings. 
Okay, I know Swift UI, I used to have to put everything in a main actor for UI changes for obvious reasons, but now yeah. like they automatically do that for you. So it sounds yeah, like- you know, there's a really strange, Swift UI in particular, there's a really strange behavior. Um, I'm gonna mix up which one it is off the top of my head, but there are, it's possible for um, property wrappers, which is used all over the place in Swift UI, to implicitly impose actor isolation. Okay. So this is the thing that trips up so many people because they don't understand. They're like, if I remove an at state object, everything, if, I re if I leave in the at state object, everything works. And if I remove it, all of a sudden I'm getting warnings about not being on the main actor. What's going on here? Okay. And the reason is that as of right now, property wrappers can change the actorness of the type that uses them. Well, I'm wondering too, like you can put, you could say something as main actor on a protocol. And then if you're putting all sorts of semantic sugar, like macros, if it's automatically putting that in there for you too, because I've been doing yeah. a lot more observation stuff and less like the older that is possible also. Um, but I can tell you that they're going to remove that behavior. So the behavior of protocol of, um, excuse me, of property wrappers, changing actorness of types is going okay. away. Okay. Because it just it's confusing everybody. Yeah. And so that's you might need to start putting more at main actors on your types because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's I've so going back to what you were talking about about like sendable and stuff, there's like um at least as far as in Xcode and in the Swift package, you can you can turn those flags on and Man, like, uh, yeah, I've run into, so there's all sorts of actor stuff you have to add for Swift 6. There's every protocol now requires any keyword. Like, it's crazy how much stuff, um, and it's understandable why we haven't seen Swift 6 uh, being ready yet uh, after after Dub Dub. So, yeah. Well, you know, I so I think that, and I'm going to make this prediction in my talk, but I think that's probably going to be the theme, I think. I think that Swift 6 is going to be rough. Because I think there are. A I lot think it's going to be the roughest since whatever Swift three or Swift four. Whenever we got ABI stability, it's been a while since we've had any rough upgrades in Swift. You know so what? yeah, I, I agree. Think it's going to be even rougher. I think it's going to be the worst wow. one yet. Okay. Yeah, and the reason because and I'm just using my um, experience as an example is that I built an API that can never be. It was using async await everywhere, and it okay. can never work. Impossible. Okay. And I needed to change the API. That API was unsupportable. Okay. And so uh, there are, I'm sure there are people right now that are building their apps happily building async await everywhere into their app in a way that will never be compatible with concurrency. Okay. And once those war so, and so this is really weird because Apple went from optional warnings to errors. This is, this is a mistake in my opinion. Well, and I, it's going to take a while. I feel like it's going to take a while. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Swiss six isn't even ready for dub dub 24 at this point. Cause That's like, possible. like we, like you said, I don't feel like it seems weird to go from optional warning to air to error. I think at some point, maybe in the next year, we'll see an Xcode release where, uh, those are going to become actual warnings. Yeah. And I think that if you are using, if you are using concurrency and don't have complete turned on, not just targeted, but complete, yeah. you're opening yourself up. You're opening yourself up to some really serious pain because if you are building a system that cannot be compatible with this, what are you going to do at that point? Yeah. And I think you want to know that now. So you want to have those warnings turned on. Right. So right. you know right away at the beginning, oh, I'm building something, but it's actually harder than I thought. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I have a good blog post. I forgot who it was who showed you how to turn those warnings on for Swift mm -hmm. 6. And I'll put that in the show notes because it's really helpful. Um, do you want to talk about, um, well, <laughs> one of the questions I had, do you miss anything regarding dispatch queue? Uh, it sounds like you do miss a lot as far as dispatch queue. Is that correct? I mean, I don't know if miss is the right terminology. I <laughs> yeah, that, I know. I know. <laughs> I, I think that um, I don't think that for I'm talking about for like complex use cases. I would be surprised if you can get away with using uh, concurrency in complex ways without using a current concurrency compatible lock and or queue. I think it's okay. possible. I think some apps can do it, yeah. but, I, but I, boy, I think you'll have a hard time. Well, I mean, you keep saying this stuff and I'm like, why, why not actors? What's wrong with actors? Isn't that kind of what it's fundamentally no, supposed to be for? Question. That's a great question. So yeah. um, uh, what are actors for? So actors protect mutable state. Okay. But what they, what they cannot do is they cannot control ordering of access to that state. So actors but are they not can, in, but they're specifically for race conditions, right? So you could, you're like when you talk about a lock, like it's essentially what an actor is for, right? 
Yeah, so the lock is about reentrancy. So actors right. are reentrant, which means that the same object, so that you can get the call into the same method multiple times. Okay. Yeah. So yes. more than one thread can be running inside of an actor, isolated method, at the same time. Say that one more time, because so I think you blew my thread, mind. More than one thread can be insi running inside of an... So to take a really, really simple example, imagine you have um, a little cache where you want to be able to like reach out to some service and it takes a long time to get that value, so you want to cache it in an actor. Okay. So you're probably going to do some little check if the value is op uh, uh, it's optional, and if the value is there, I'm going to return it. And if not, I'm going to go do this await, and I'm going to get it, and then I'm going to return it. This is like a really classic caching pattern. I ho hope you're following what I'm talking about. That I doesn't so. work with an actor. Even something okay. like that does not work with an actor, because between the check and the await call, another object can come in and make that call again. See, my thought, my whole idea with the actor was that, like, it's basically a way to make sure that somebody can't, like, two people, two people, two, two threads can't do something to an actor at the same time. Like, I thought it was kind of like that, where it was, like, essentially a queue, where it's like... You, you know what? It, in a lot of ways, it is exactly like a dispatch queue. But the problem with, and it's the same kinds of problems with dispatch queues, where the dispatch queue, the, the body of the queue, is synchronous. Right. So, and the same, it's the same kind of thing with an actor, is that the synchronous code, yes, is serial, and only one thread can be running in the synchronous code at one time. But as soon as you put an await in there, more than one thread can hop in there. Okay, okay. And so, and that's the danger, is that it's kind of similar to queues, where like if you need to do some work in a queue and it's all serial work, you're safe, you can totally isolate everything. But if you want to hop out to some other queue, do some long work and then get back into that queue, somebody else can get it, another thread can get into that queue at the same time. It's a very similar kind of problem. Okay. Uh, and so um, there's this wonderful package called Semaphore that is a concurrency compatible lock and it lets you solve that specific problem. If you yeah. look at the actual implementation required to make something simple like a cached value in an actor, it is bananas. It is okay. bananas how complicated it is. And it's okay. because of this reentrancy. Okay. Uh, and a, a simple, a simple concurrency compatible lock. You cannot use the regular locks and semaphores. Okay. But a concurrency compatible lock makes it so much easier. It's worth it. Okay. Yeah, I've actually had to use a dispatch semaphore for a async call because th there is no like that's the closest thing to a semaphore I had in, uh, in, in Swift. So, yeah, yes, I feel like that's definitely it. something missing. It is, and so there's there's one built, but the dispatch semaphore has a problem because the concurrency runtime requires that all actors be able to make forward progress, mm -hmm. and, a, and a regular semaphore breaks that requirement. So you rust you risk hangs using a regular kind of lock. Okay. Um. So was there anything you missed from dispatch queues? So so we're talking about locks here and all this. Uh, why actors don't solve that problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So but so there's also there's no mechanism actors. Even if reentrancy is a thing, actor reentrancy is a thing that they address, which is being seriously talked about for Swift 6, because a lot okay. of people are having this problem. Okay. Even if that gets addressed, it still does not help you with ordering. Or if right. you are interacting right. with a stateful system, right. there's no way to control how things go. So th there you need a queue. A queue is a thing that you're going to need. Because one of the things I ran into when I first started async await was that I assumed in a function when you run a bunch of async stuff in a function, it was going to do it in... Uh, in not in an order. So I'm in like the opposite boat. And, and then I learned, oh, if you want things to not run in an order, then you have to do like the async let um, in order to do things in a non-order. This is not what you're running into. You're running no, into the uh, opposite. Yes, that, is, that is confusing. You're right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I was like, I don't like these things don't depend on each other. Compiler, please just run it in whatever, like run them all together. I don't care. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, oh, you have to do this async let, which is totally not, like that's a little bit weird to me. I agree with you. It is uh, weird. because it's like the whole point of async away to me is like I don't these things don't it, unless they depend on each other and I figure the compiler can figure that out. I don't need to tell it. Like it should it should just run it in whatever order. I don't care. Like um, so that was one of the things I first had to had to learn is like oh yeah use this async let to let it know yeah. um, that I don't care the order. Yeah, well, you can do that for things that are, have no dependency. So if you're doing like A, B, C, and they don't matter, right. then you can do that kind of thing. But if you have like, you're going to do A, and it's an async call, and then you need to use the result of that in B, 
now the ordering is required. So right. within a particular context, within a particular async context, it's all going to run things in order. Right. It's by default. spreading these contexts yeah. around, yeah, which yeah. is your issue where, where you have function over around. here and function over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, sure. That's, so that's one of the reasons why I think there was this deep misunderstanding, even internally at Apple, is the, when, when async await was originally introduced, there's this automatic translation that you can use between a, um, a completion handler, handler. Call yeah. and objective C. Refactor and Xcode, yeah. It'll just like yeah. magically make it work. And I think that is that was done because I don't think there was a deep appreciation for how dangerous that kind of thing can be. Because mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. kind of change can be so, if you're thinking, oh, I'm just gonna change it into an async, uh, uh, an async await and I'm gonna wrap it in a task, that it has different semantics. And so you're changing, when you make these refactors, you're actually changing the semantics of how the code works as well. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Um, and I'm not sure everybody understood that one. <laughs> what kind of, like, I guess it seems like you're looking at some of the Swift proposals. What do you see out there as something you're looking forward to that kind of remedies some of these issues? Uh, oh, well, there's a, there are many changes that are out there. So one uh, really difficult one that I think is also pretty hard to understand even before concurrency was out there is needing to do stuff in a D init. So in your D init method, mm -hmm. if you have a main actor thing, you're thinking, okay, my D init is going to run in the main actor too, but that is actually not the case. No. Um, and I think that is really surprising to people, even from objective C, you might think like, how could it be my view is being deallocated, not on the main thread. That's doesn't seem right. Um, even if you met, like, even if you mark your whole type as or class as main actor, it's still not going to run. Din okay. Yeah, yeah, and this is this can be a really big problem for certain yes, patterns. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know that they have fully sorted out what they're going to do about it, but it is an understood problem. Okay. And because UI Kit, I don't even think this is well known, but UI Kit um, and UI View in particular goes through these Herculean efforts to try to make sure your D in it or your your D alloc actually does run on the main thread. Okay. But it requires an enormous amount of work at the <laughs> app library level to make it happen. Okay. Um, and so I think that um, they're trying to solve this problem, and I think that'd be wonderful. But I don't know yet that there's currently any solution out there. Okay. Okay. So that's Anything one, else? That's one yeah. that's being talked about. Well, there's this whole property wrapper changing actorness. That's a that's a really confusing one. I'm really happy to see that one has been accepted and it's gonna gonna happen. Okay. Have you looked at any of the observation stuff? Does any of that? No, I haven't. No, okay, I, I want okay. to, but I haven't seen it yet. Okay, okay. I mean, there's also things that are tangentially related to async await. Like, uh, I have had a really hard time using um, async sequences. Okay. And one, of the, one of the reasons why is async sequence does not have a um, primary, the protocol does not have a primary associated type. So you can't use any async... Um, yeah, that's no, right. I, you can't use any async sequence. Right. And so that's usually not a big deal unless it's at an API boundary. Okay. Yeah, and I can see how that. Deal because what type are you supposed to return? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's weird. Um, it is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Because so they slapped is, on primary associated types so many places. It's so weird that. You know, it was, it was, it was intentional. Um, and the reason why was they were thinking about how they were going to expose the error property of. Um, async sequence as well. And I think okay. that's what caused the hook, the, the hang up. Okay. Um, but I would love to see it. Yeah, I yeah, would yeah. love to see it because that's, that's been a problem for sure. And I'll put a link to my talk at Swift Heroes somewhere in here. So yes, yes, people yes. can check that out if they want to know why primary associated types are so important. So was there anything you looked at at WWDC this year? You said, you said a few things, like what specifically? And anything well, that thinking... related to Chime, I guess. Uh, well, you know, I was hopeful for some more extension kit changes. There's a few little things that have been problematic, but there was nothing there. Okay. Um, uh, no, there was nothing really. I mean, I'm always interested in what goes on with the text system because there was this big migration from text kit one to text kit two. Okay. Um, and I would say that that has gone largely terribly. Text kit two is, is getting better, but it is so, it was, it was launched in an absolutely unusable state. I, I'm amazed that it, that it shipped. Okay. Uh, that was with, I think that was macOS 11. So that was two years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Last year, it got a lot better. Okay. Um, but still has some really major bugs that I don't know how to work around. I haven't tried hard, but I know that it's a problem. Okay. Um, so I was hoping for a little bit of talk about like what's new in the tech system and maybe some changes that would help. And I didn't see anything there. 
Um, the things I did see, I think the macro stuff is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I know a lot of people have started to feel a little bit like Swift is getting to be too complicated of a language. Um, yeah. And it's complicated. It uh, can be, yes. But, yeah, but I, I think that it's, I think it's a very interesting direction to go in anyways. These are the fundamental problems. They have to be solved somewhere. And so I like the idea of um, people thinking deeply and trying to come up with a, a solution in the language. I have an idea for a talk here about yeah. how complicated Swift is. I, it's It's been floating in my head, but yeah, I have an idea for a talk I want to put together on why people should try not being too intimidated by it. And, you know, but anyway, you know, you'll see that in the future. Future, yeah, well, that's, that's in the awesome. future soon. Um, cool. Was there anything else you wanted to cover about async way, about Chime, before we close out? Well, you know, so um, uh, last year, was all about me adopting extension kit and building mm -hmm. this API that was never going to work. And then this year, kind of in the background, I've been slowly chipping away at fixing it. And I can say that it's, it's been um, incredibly difficult. And I think the reason why it's difficult, one, is that actorness is very viral. So if you find there's this one little thing you need to change to be main actor, it's okay. a big, it can be a big problem. Okay. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is, you know, you got to be careful with protocols because protocols and actors and even main actor isolated objects don't always mix. And I think that we've been very, as like a Swift community, have been very um, quick to use protocols everywhere. And that can be problematic okay. when, um, in, uh, when um, adopting concurrency. So that was a, one that was tricky for me. Um, but I have, I'm pretty close actually. So I, I'm almost finished updating an enormous amount of packages and um, a big API surface to actually be something that works correctly and concurrent with concurrency and is, I think, also um, what I want. So I'm very happy with that progress, but it's been very tough. Awesome. Well, I am excited, even though I won't be in Toronto, I am excited that you'll be presenting on this topic and telling people all the lessons that you've learned. I think it's going to be awesome and fascinating. Matt, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Where can people find you and Chime online? Uh, well, Chime is at ChimeHQ.com. Um, and I've just finished removing all of the bird site references. So you can find me on Mastodon. <laughs> you can find me Mastodon.social slash at um, Maddie M. Uh, it's on a bird site today. Today, as of the That's recording, right. Right. it's it's an X site. So right. you yeah, actually well, have, we'll actually I'll have to, that. yeah, I'll have to fix, I'll have to fix this in editing. Make sure that people know it's the X site, not the bird site yeah. today. Um, people can find me on the X site at Leo G. Dion, um, but I'm also on Mastodon at leogdn at c.im my company is bright digit please take some time if you're watching this on youtube to like and subscribe and if you're listening to this on a podcast player please give me a review if there's anything you want to talk about or anything you want to hear about let me know dm me email me um send me an x i guess i don't know whatever it is uh, but uh and also buy a ticket to swift toronto if you haven't already hopefully this episode will be out in time for you to do that thank you everybody and i look forward to talking to you again bye everyone <laughs>